Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the webinar Old Dog New Tricks Modern IG Applications with Pivotal Cloud Foundry and Redis Labs. Uh, we will be starting in uh, just a couple of minutes. Uh, we will, we're waiting for everybody to sign in and log in and get settled. So give us a minute, uh, you, we will be on mute until then. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our webinar on Old Dog New Tricks Modernize Your Applications with Pivotal Cloud Foundry and Redis Lab. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Uh, our presenters today include myself. I'm Lena Joshi. I run product marketing at Redis Labs. And joining me today is Richard Sorotor of Pivotal Labs. Hi, good morning. Uh, great to be here. I also run uh, product marketing for Pivotal Cloud Foundry and Spring, so excited to show some things off today. Awesome. The webcast today will be recorded. Uh, we will, after the webcast, send you an email with the link, and we will be taking questions throughout this webinar. If you need to post your questions, please use the Q&A panel on the bottom right of your screen, and we'll be handling them uh, as we in the order that they are received. Now that we have the housekeeping uh, out of the way, we'll get started with, uh, with our topic today. Um, our agenda consists of uh, the following main sections. The first is uh, the business case for why modern applications need real-time in-process analytics and why uh, Redis fits for both transactional and analytic scenarios. Uh, Richard will then help us take a look at the bigger picture of application delivery and there will be a demo of Pivotal and Redis Labs. We will conclude with some next steps and, uh, uh, and any other questions that uh, the attendees have. Uh, with that, let's get started. So I'll start with um, what is the business driver for modern applications needing real-time in-process analytics? Now, over the last few years, uh, applications have gone through this sea change where uh, increasingly, they are web-based, they are mobile, they are social, they are catering to users, even cons consumers and business users are accessing applications uh, over their mobile phones, their iPads, their laptops, uh, over the internet. Now, uh, accessing applications over the internet binds you into an average round-trip latency of 50 milliseconds. Uh, and the end user expectations around response times is something like 100 milliseconds. Uh, if you if you go above 100 milliseconds while responding to a user, then typically you you suffer from a user's wrath, frustration, disappointment, which means that uh, which means that you have as an application owner or developer, your application has to comp uh, complete its.
processing, database access, and return the response within 50 milliseconds of round, round trip time. Which means that the database that you use for these accesses, especially with interactive responsive applications, needs to be something that can return responses in less than one milliseconds under conditions of any load. So um, this, is, this is the reason why we've, we've been moving towards more and more high performance databases uh, overall uh, for handling uh, transactions. But what is the driver for needing analytics at those same speeds? Well, uh, the, uh, the driver behind the analytics is, first of all, when a consumer is interacting with the application and he's making a purchase or reading an article or clicking on something, an offer made in the context of a user's current action is way more powerful than trying to reach the customer later. This is why analytics around, oh, like, if customer did action X, it should, we should present him with offer Y, is very, very powerful. The experience from the customer side is the, it, the customer thinks that the application is being intelligent and recommending to them, we think you will also like Y. Um, it also leads to a better user experience. If you have an application that consists of many choices that are used, many paths that your user can go down, uh, then anticipating intelligently based on a, cu a customer's current action, what they're likely to do next, makes for a fantastic user experience. And lastly, if you're not doing, <laughs> you're not presenting these offers or you're not making a uh, better user experience available to your customers, you can be certain that your competition is certainly out to delight users and customers with that intelligent experience, with that uh, intelligent offer. Uh, so you run the risk of uh, losing market share, uh, losing your uh, loyalty if your experience is not as good as what the what, uh, other folks in your market have. Um, so here's where Redis comes in. Uh, Redis is used extensively as a transactional database and uh, I'll spend some time talking about why and also why, uh, why it's really perfect for these real-time analytic scenarios. Uh, so first of all, if you're not already familiar with Redis, uh, Redis is open source. It's the leading in-memory database platform uh, supporting any high-performance transactional or analytic use case. And Redis Labs is the open source home and the commercial provider of Redis. Um, why do people use Redis? First of all, because of its outstanding performance. Uh, Redis uh, and the benchmark that you can see shows that in a right intensive scenario, real-time data ingest scenario, Redis outperforms pretty much every other NoSQL. And uh, it can also deliver this performance with the least amount of hardware. We have a supporting benchmark that uh, shows that we have, we can deliver one up to one or 1.5 million writes per second using a single modest AWS EC2 instance. So up to 1.5 million writes per second at sub-millisecond latency with a single modest AWS EC2 instance. Now, performance is one aspect of Redis. The second big reason that makes Redis so widely adopted is that uh, because of its versatile data structures, it simplifies a lot of complexity that typically application developers encounter. So in addition to the regular key value um, structure, uh, Redis also supports data structures like sets, sorted sets, lists, bitmaps, hashes, hyperlog logs. And these structures uh, implement, make implementation of particular use cases really, really drop dead simple with, the, with minimal effort and minimal programming required. And last but not the least, um, earlier this year we introduced the notion of Redis modules which allows for any data processing functionality to be imported into Redis uh, with, the, with access to its high performance internals and implemented uh, with a great deal of simplicity. And I'll talk both about how these data structures contribute to analytics and how uh, the modules contribute to analytics as well. Uh, so on the performance, uh, I mentioned the benchmark. Uh, <clears throat> we did a benchmark earlier in the year which, show, which demonstrates that in a simple polling applications handling hundreds and thousands of requests, 
uh, the end-to-end -end response times are the lowest with Redis Labs, and the high, and at the same time, the throughput of the application is also the highest with Redis Labs compared to other NoSQL. Now, in addition to having the highest performance, Redis also needs the least no, least number of resources to deliver this high performance. So the benchmark on the right. Uh, shows numbers published by those individual companies or, or for how many servers they need on Google Compute Platform uh, to deliver 1 million operations per second. You can see Datastax needs 300, <laughs> 1 million writes per second, uh, and then Couchbase needs uh, 50, and Redis Labs needs only 2. Um, <clears throat> Uh, about the data structures, uh, the different data structures are like Lego building blocks uh, for your app. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples for this, but in addition to um, these data structures not only simplify programming, but they also provide a performance boost, uh, another level of performance boost, because each of the data structures comes with commands that operate on the data in memory right next to where the data is stored. So there is less back and forth, very uh, completely simplified operations, and uh, extremely high performance that you can gain. <clears throat> uh, as a result of Redis's versatility, it is used in a number of popular use cases. Uh, the use cases include high-speed transactions, real-time data ingest, job and queue management, user session store, but also analytic use cases uh, as you can see from this uh, from the chart on the left, so there uh, very often a uh, Redis is used for analytic use cases, and the types of solutions using Redis include not just mobile, e-commerce, corporate applications, or social applications, but also analytics, uh, targeting and personalization applications, fraud detection, interactive reporting, and more. Um, so let's take an, so so far we've theoretically understood that Redis is good for analytics. Let's take an actual example. Uh, let's take a bid management example. The application problem is many users are bidding on items and you instantly need to show who's leading, in what order, by how much. And you also want to display corresponding analytics, like how many users are bidding in a particular range. And typically, if you use disk-based databases to, for these real-time high-scale calculations, they are just way too slow and not able to perform. So Redis data structures, the data structure you would use in this scenario is sorted sets. And sorted sets automatically keeps a list of users and scores uh, updated and in order. And it kind of looks something like this. You simply add items with the associated scores to Redis. And then as I mentioned before, commands associated with Redis, like Z range, Z rev range, will get your top users. Z rank will get any users rank instantaneously. Z count will return a count of users in a range, and Z range by score will return all the all the users in the range by their bits. Now these commands are really what make it a delight to use Redis because you can you can get real time analytics about your bids instantaneously. Uh, using these uh, data structures. So this is uh, an example, uh, you know, how you would add, how you would increment directly, and how you would also retrieve information from Redis. Needless to say, Redis is high performance, and the implementation of the data structure itself ensures that this is pretty much the fastest, most efficient way you can implement bid management, as an example. Another example, and there is a white paper and a, and, a, uh, and a blog published on this along with the associated code, is Redis for recommendations. And when you think of the recommendations problem in the application context, it's really a problem that involves users, items, likes, dislikes, similarities, and a bunch of set comparisons. You need to do set comparisons of user likes, user dislikes to create similarity scores, which, which is then stored, stored in the sorted set. You do set comparisons of similar user likes and dislikes with items that are not yet purchased by the current user. And you want to do, if you want to do this really fast, you need to meet high speed and low latency requirements. So once again, uh, Redis is uh, one of the few data stores that, that offers the concept of sets and sorted sets. And sets, set operations are executed in memory at blazing fast speeds 
And you can use these operations to intersect multiple sets, add multiple sets, determine membership, retrieve all values. And using a combination of sets and stored sets, you can pretty much implement a recommendations engine with a very few lines of code. And on our website, we publish our blog and also the code necessary that you could use for a generic um, recommendations engine. And just to explain a Redis uh, set with a picture, um, you can see you simply add items to the set and you, you can use the commands that I mentioned to intersect the set. Now, those are all sort of uh, run-of-the-mill uh, analytic scenarios. What about scenarios where you're not able to predict uh, what, type of, uh, what type of recommendation you need to present to a user? Uh, often, the framework that you use for these types of things is a machine learning framework. Um, and uh, these days, over the last couple of years, Apache Spark has gained a, a lot of traction in uh, generating and processing uh, uh, large volumes of data in memory and, uh, and performing uh, these unstructured type of analyses. Now, Spark can ingest data from a number of data sources, uh, however, and, and process it in memory. However, even the in-memory processing of Spark uh, has some overhead steps associated with it. You need to read, deserialize, process, serialize, and write. And w in order to simplify this, we have created a Spark Redis connector, which allows you to use Redis as a shared in-memory data store uh, with Spark. So, you eliminate sort of the interim overhead steps and you simply access the data stored in Redis with access to its, with its uh, data structures and data types and you end up accelerating the performance of Spark considerably. Uh, in, this, uh, in this connector, we also implemented, um, uh, we also implemented uh, a, a way for Spark SQL to directly be translated into Redis commands. So if you're running analytics or BI using Spark SQL, uh, if you're using Redis as a service, uh, as a serving layer, you can simply retrieve the data from Redis without uh, having to implement uh, uh, any any specific commands yourself. Uh, so, uh, just just a quick uh, data point, a proof point of uh, how Spark gets accelerated with Redis. Uh, we 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 used um, time series data um, over <coughs> over a Spark implementation and compared how long it took to execute uh, range queries or time slice queries. Um, and with Spark using HDFS or Spark using Tachyon or simply using Spark process memory, uh, you could see that the execution times were still uh, about 45 times higher than what you could get than, uh, than if you used Redis as your serving layer for this Spark time series query. Uh, so the benchmark shows that if you use Redis alongside Spark, you're not only are your queries accelerated, but they are faster by over 45 times compared to Tachyon or Spark, and up to 100 times compared to HDFS, naturally because HDFS is, is displaced. <coughs> um, So, um, in addition to in addition to having a connector to Spark, we've also implemented additional analytics modules inside of Redis to sort of accelerate the delivery of machine learning. Uh, so, the first of these modules is Neural Redis. It's open source. It was created by Salvatore as a uh, and it implements a very simple neural network as a native data type for Redis. So, um, uh, it's very fast and very accurate for simple machine learning use cases that have to deal with uh, non-visual data, simply have to do deal with enhancing user experience and things like that. It includes training, classification, regression in one place. Um, related to Spark, however, we also created Redis ML, which accelerates the delivery of machine learning mod models with Spark ML. So models are can be stored, retrieved, and updated natively from Redis in the, using this module. And the second thing it enables is simultaneous access of these models by applications which are written in different languages. Uh, and <clears throat> you will see a benchmark that shows about a 5 to 10 time acceleration of execution of these machine learning models uh, when executed directly from Redis. 
And similarly, Redis TensorFlow accelerates the delivery of machine learning models um, that are generated using TensorFlow. <coughs> Um, so this is an example scenario of how you would implement Redis ML with, uh, or what the difference is if you implement Redis ML with Spark ML. Uh, so typical machine learning with Spark ML involves uh, you know, some base data that gets loaded into Spark. Spark is used for training the models, generating and training models. Models are saved off and delivered via a custom server to the client application or uh, they're used to pre-compute results which then feed the client application. Now with Redis ML, the model generated from Spark can be directly stored in Redis and they can also be updated on the fly and client applications written in many different languages can access these models from Redis. Uh, the end result is 13 times faster classification time over Spark and um, uh, and of course, uh, the benefit of being able to use the uh, the, mo the models across different uh, different uh, applications written in different languages. Now, if you think of uh, if you think of what is an actual customer scenario, uh, think of uh, once again the recommendation scenario where you have a user vector that includes demographics, history, preferences, segment. And also the item vector, which includes tags related to the item, keywords, business context, or social relevance. And then offline, uh, typically a customer would compute a joint vector or using the two vectors that are being kept updated on, on a real-time basis, train a regression model, pre-compute the results, and use it in their client application. However, with Redis ML, with real-time machine learning, the user vector and the item vector are getting updated in real time, and the model is being updated in real time as the client application presents items to users. So this just allows you to fuel machine learning at a much different rate. So I can see a question come up, uh, and the question says, uh, is the Spark connector open source? Uh, so just going back quickly, uh, the Spark connector, as well as the all of these modules that accelerate machine learning type of analytics, are uh, are all open source. And uh, the Spark connector, if you uh, if you like, we can uh, email you a link with the uh, with with the link to the connector, as well as uh, the benchmark uh, that shows the acceleration that you can get from uh, Redis. If there are any other questions, please continue to type them in the uh, bottom window. Uh, we'll now start talking about Pivotal and Red Redis Labs. So first of all, um, Redis Labs delivers enterprise class Redis. And the reason it is uh, highly valued is because of its uh, amazing high availability. So we deliver cross-rack zone data center uh, in-memory replication, as well as instant automatic failover. Um, uh, we allow your application to deal with Redis as if it's a single instance and we, we do all the scaling, clustering, uh, sharding in the back, uh, automation in the, back, uh, in the background. Uh, we've also optimized open source Redis uh, to ensure stable, predictable, linearly scaling performance. Uh, what ends up happening with, with, um, uh, with the level of automation, the ability to run Redis on Flash, and the, uh, and the reduction of the number of scripts and maintenance and updates that you have to do is you end up uh, realizing a number of operational cost savings. And we also have the largest number of Redis experts on tap to provide enterprise class management and support for Redis. Uh, so these are some uh, factoids from our customers that, uh, that, uh, that validate sort of what Redis Labs is valued for. 78% uh, of our surveyed customers value our ability to provide HA, and very often we are known as the only HA, truly HA Redis available. Uh, so we provide persistence, auto failover, cross zone, multi region, multi data center replication. We're valued for our stable, high performance, and for our seamless scaling and clustering. Now, uh, I'll hand off to uh, Richard uh, to talk about how we work with Pivotal and uh, how you would use it in a Pivotal environment. Great. Thanks, Lena. 
Yeah, so thanks for teeing that up. So Redis Labs is one of uh, many great partners Pivotal Cloud Foundry uses to extend your web applications using great data stores such as this or other modules. And the Redis Labs team built a tile in our world which, which lets you simply deploy a broker to connect to an existing Redis Labs uh, enterprise cluster, which is great. So it makes it really easy as an administrator to set this up once and then developers through self-service can create instances and create databases without having to open tickets, without having to go request things. So we built a nice integration there. You can go to the next slide. And so to the bigger point that, that Lena teed up was, you know, it, it's great to have databases like this. It's great to have these services. And there's this whole change in how we've been building applications, period. Gone are these days of monolithic releases that take months or years that have tightly coupled databases and application platforms that are very fragile and you're terrified to redeploy them or patch them because you, you're worried something will go down. So that's kind of the this current state, but there's so much changing in that. You've got microservices now. You've got development that happens in a much quicker way, a much more iterative way. You've got a number of different abstractions that instead of these sort of app servers on machines, you've got apps on disposable infrastructure, meaning containers are going to come and go and you don't have persistent storage. You have deployment where it's almost a business decision of when you want to deploy now it has nothing to do with technology because you're able to continuously deliver your web applications. But then as you think about day two, all those things that happen after you deploy an app, it's not about keeping track of all your servers sometimes, it's about keeping track of services. That's the customer facing aspect of this and this whole change of application delivery has gone from let's make IT more efficient so let's actually create better user experiences. Let's have better engagement. So it's an exciting time as we focus on feedback loops and delivering iterative progress that our customers can use versus these sort of big bang, tightly planned releases, which, which candidly still always seem to miss their deadlines. So it's an exciting way that we're delivering. The questions become, well, can my technology keep up with this model? If you go to the next slide. One thing you'll hear the term of is cloud native, something Pivotal's been, been using for a while and, and coined a bit ago. And this idea of applications, it might not even be born in the cloud, but the idea that I'm able to use these patterns, which help me quickly create, test, deploy, and operate services, so that it is really realistic that you know, Fortune 100 companies are now coming to us and saying, it's amazing that I can, I can fix a bug in a few minutes and get it to production, or I can literally think of a new service and see that in production in, in such a short time window. And it's this constant iterative development that takes in feedback and ships out great code. And even if it's not great code and something went wrong, you can quickly update it. This has really been an evolution that, if we go to the next slide, is most teams have started with some sort of automated scripting, saying, look, let's, let's try to create some repeat, repeatability in our environment so it's not so unpredictable and so ad hoc every time we do deployments or patches or any of those things. So they kind of start with some automation, some containers, some scripting. But as you start to think about a platform that says, how do I have to, I don't want to deal with all of the muck of keeping virtual machines up to date or even asking my developers to somehow become full stack developers and understand everything from reactive front ends to firewall rules. That's a lot to ask. So Pivotal Cloud Foundry is a platform that includes a number of different things. You run on multiple clouds, whether you want to run on premises, you want to run on Amazon or Google or Azure. And if you jump to the next slide, it's made up of a few different components that orchestrate different clouds, and that's part of the platform. But then Pivotal itself also has a software methodology, test-driven development, pairing, agile delivery. And so we often couple these things for customers to say, not only here is a platform, because frankly, a platform without better methodology will probably result in no better difference for you. So how can we think about how do we build software better and then here's a great platform to execute it on. So those are two big parts and then the number of data services around big data and Hadoop and storage that also complement the platform and then of course a fantastic ecosystem including folks like Redis Labs. The platform itself again made up of multiple tiers. We, we orchestrate all of the clouds, whatever you want to run on, no big deal, we take care of that. It's software that you can run on premises, you can run in the cloud. Windows or Linux will support regular .NET applications, .NET Core, Java, Spring, Node, Go, Ruby, PHP. Kind of pick your poison, bring whatever you'd like. And the idea is how are we helping accelerate software delivery? How are we making it easier for developers to build great apps 
get them deployed and not have so many snowflake environments that are configured uniquely, and also kind of handle the scale of cloud. I mean, it's great that Redis Labs provides a highly available Redis because, again, as we think about the whole cloud model is, is not worrying necessarily about mean time between failure because we assume that failures happen, but mean time to recovery and having great HA architecture that assumes that individual things can go wrong and will go wrong, but the system itself is hardened and resilient enough and your apps are that resilient that you can tolerate that. So I believe next up, I think I'm going to be uh, doing a little dog and pony demo for you. And one of the use cases that Lena pointed out was something like session state management. And so I wanted to actually start with a, an easy example of that. And it built a little Spring application. Uh, Pivotal is the company behind technologies like Spring and Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, as well as RabbitMQ and Tomcat and a number of other technologies that Pivotal is the steward of. But in my case, I wanted to take a Spring application and I wanted to use Redis as my session store. That's a popular use case for us because we often help customers modernize their existing apps. And one of the first things that we, we look at is, what are you doing with session and local storage? Are you writing log files to your local machine? Are you using in-memory session like, hey, most of us developers did for a while because you had you know, two known web servers and you could do sticky sessions in your load balancer and that was just easy. But as we build more disposable infrastructure, we build more scalable apps, those patterns that might have worked 15 years ago are really anti-patterns now. So what I wanted to build was a simple Spring application that used Redis for my session store and then I'm going to demonstrate how I can easily scale up and down my application and still maintain the same session because I'm using a highly available, durable session store like Redis. So if you're building Spring apps, and at this point Spring Boot is, is downloaded about 9 million times per month, you can go to start.spring.io or you can use your favorite development environment and you can just build applications that make sense. And you might say, look, I want to use Redis. So I'm going to use the, the Redis plugin here and I'm going to build some other components. And I build myself an application using Spring Tool Suite. And it's pretty basic because I'm in marketing, so I don't build super complicated apps. In this case, when I request the home page, I'm just going to give the person a home page. And when they post that page, I'm going to take the name that they've typed into that page, and I'm going to go ahead and store that in session. So that should mean that you know when subsequent web, web requests come in, I can pull from session and show that on the page. So when I view that page again, I'm going to go ahead and get information from session. Now what's interesting again is I scale to more and more instances. Those applications just came online, but they're still able to access the same session store that those instances that have been alive for 10 or 20 minutes access. So really neat model. I'm also pulling the unique container ID so that you can see as I refresh the page, I'm on different containers, I'm on different virtual machines, and I'm using the same session. This stuff's really easy again because Spring integrates very nicely with Redis. So I can just simply tell my Spring application to use Redis. It's, it's kind of comically simple to do. And then finally with Cloud Foundry, I don't have to tell it much. What's the name of my application? How much memory should I give each container? How many instances do I want at startup time? This could be one, this could be 100, however many individual instances as I scale out my app. Where can I get the bits that I actually want to deploy? And in this case, what kind of application do I want to deploy? And I'm going to create one of these in a moment called Redis Session, this would be my session, then I'm going to link my application service to my application. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So I'm going to go into my browser, and I'm on Pivotal Web Services. Now, Pivotal Web Services, this is our hosted version of PCF, and so anybody can access this for just an hourly cost. There's a free trial as well, so you can get 80-something hours for free. If I go to the marketplace, I can see some of the partners we've integrated with, and in this case, I do have the Redis Labs component here. Now this isn't the Redis Labs Enterprise Cluster, it's not the tile because I'm using a hosted version, but this gives you a pretty similar feeling for what it's like to engage with this sort of environment. And I have multiple plans. I'm uh, going to be cheap and use the free one. And I can give this service a name, and I think I called this Redis Session. I can add it to a space in Cloud Foundry. You can organize your teams by spaces and organizations and, and create almost a multi-tenant cloud within your cloud, which is great. And I'll go ahead and add that. So what this does is provision me a new instance of a Redis session, a database in the Redis cloud, which is great. And if I view that service, I can even jump into a little management page, and we've done some single sign-on integration so that I can actually do a little bit of database management. 
within the Redis console, which is great. So I can at least see, look, I have a new database provisioned here, pretty neat, or pending, and it's already done. The power of cloud. So what I want to do is now push my application. I have a few applications here. None of these are this application right here. So from the command line, I can go ahead and just push my application. Now also from the command line, I can do things like see which applications I have deployed in Cloud Foundry, or I could easily see Redis Labs in the marketplace if I do CF Marketplace, and I can see all the different services that are available in this particular Cloud Foundry environment, which is nice to do, and I can see it, it hanging out right here, so I could provision that as well. In my case, though, I just want to do the magical command CF push. So what this does is it reads my manifest, it goes ahead and packages my application, pull uploads it all, puts it into a container, so it creates a container on the fly, you don't have to build your own containers, we'll do that for you. It goes ahead and creates the container, configures the DNS and network routing, does any firewall changes, binds to the Redis session service real quickly here, it loads up an app server, configures that app server in Tomcat, and runs that for me. And so it does all of these things that if you imagine in traditional IT it would be about 15 tickets. And instead, in roughly 30 seconds, I'm going to have an application on the public internet, and I can easily do this through continuous delivery if I want to, and use Jenkins, or use Concourse, or other ways to not have to type in a command. For demonstration purposes, I'm doing it myself. But it's really a powerful way that I can go from I have code to I have this in production in virtually no time. And that's such an exciting thing instead of dealing with all of the, boy, can I get myself a virtual machine? Could you please you know, update the firewall or set up a load balancer rule? None of that. So here, just in a few moments, I'm going to have a couple of instances running. Sure enough, I do. And if I jump over to Pivotal Web Services again, it's already showing here, Sorotor Session Web. I've got two instances running of my application, and I can go ahead and view that application in the browser. That was quick. And so I've built a, a remarkably strong application here that simply takes a name and sticks it into session. All right, so I'll, I'll submit that. Fantastic, my, my name works, and I'm in the application. So what it's doing now, this is the ID of the container. So the reason that matters is I can refresh this, and you see that ID changes. I have two containers, and they're both sharing the same session. So it doesn't matter that I have two, it's fine. And I can jump back into the Redis cloud, and I could easily go into some of these interfaces and see that I'm actually hitting Redis. So this is great because this is in memory. I'm not going to disk. Right? I'm getting a good performance here. I'm using Redis. Fantastic. I'm sharing it. So I get a lot of great experience here. I can do some more advanced metrics and see a little more here as I start hitting the application. And so I'm getting some real-time information about what's going on. But what's really exciting is what happens if, you know what, maybe I don't feel like having two instances. I think I need more than that. Usually, this involves begging or borrowing or stealing. And instead, I can just simply create more instances. And I could do the same thing with the command line. And I could scale down as well, saying, look, I don't need so many instances. This application's doing great. But I'm going to scale these two up. And in just a few seconds, I get two brand new containers, probably on some other virtual machines. They're also pointing at this exact same Redis cache. So no downtime, application still up and running, doesn't seem to matter. But what's great is I'm actually scaling up my application while this is happening. And so as I scale up and down, I'm getting the exact same session state, which is great. So your customers have no idea that you decided to scale up and down. But for them, they're actually getting a much more high-performing application. So now we're getting some different IDs here, as now I should have four total running instances of my application here. So with this sort of model, I can see that I've got the service. I'm tied to Redis Cloud. I'm able to scale this really easily. I've got four running containers now, scale up and down. And I'm using a single session state, which is much, much more exciting than using in-memory session. Then all of a sudden, when I scale apps, those other apps have no idea about my session. So Redis and Cloud Foundry make a great pairing. As I combine these two sort of services, I have a highly available, resilient app tier. And now I have a highly available resilient data tier, and they're decoupled. So as I deploy this to different Cloud Foundry environments, I might use different even implementations of Redis if I wanted to. That could work. But in our case, we really like what Redis Labs offers us. It gives us a great HA story for all of our web apps. And as you do continuous delivery, it's exciting to think about keeping your database in line with that. Lena, back to you. Wonderful demo, Richard. Um, there was uh, one question online. Uh, the question was, where is Redis Cloud running in this example? 
So if you don't mind, uh, let me answer the, the first part of the question and then uh, you know, if you want to add something, I'll, I'll let you add. Sure. So uh, Redis Cloud uh, actually is a cloud service, highly available cloud service provided by Redis Labs. It runs on all the public clouds, including AWS, Google Compute Platform, or Google Cloud Platform, Azure, and IBM SoftLayer. It is also integrated with Pivotal Cloud Foundry, the public service. The um, the other services uh, that have Redis Cloud include Heroku and so on and so forth. Now, the the difference with uh, with uh, Redis Labs Enterprise Cluster is that we use the same software to deliver this Redis Cloud experience. So this Redis Cloud experience underneath the covers comes with automation provided by our software called Redis Labs Enterprise Cluster, which is available as a tile inside of Pivotal Network. So if you wanted to run a Redis Labs on on prem in your on-premises environment with Pivotal Cloud Foundry, you now have easy access and um, uh, it becomes really easy to deploy highly available uh, Redis. Um, Richard, would you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's great. Knowing that you've got that sort of distribution gives people even more confidence that they're not going to be subject to the whims of performance of one cloud. Awesome. And then uh, there is a question online uh, about, um, uh, I think uh, previously in your slides you had mentioned that after every deployment, is it necessary to do validation both from an infrastructure and application perspective? This is for you, Richard. Uh, as you do any deployment of your app, of course, there might be, you know, as you're doing continuous integration, you're always running your unit tests and integration tests, and only if those tests pass do you ever move to a packaging stage and the deployment stage. So ideally, the, the, the testing of, of everything in your application is, is great by the time it ever even gets to production. And then you may still have production monitoring in place. You might be using built-in monitoring that Cloud Foundry provides or an add-on, something like New Relic, to also provide application intelligence. And, you know, you're almost always testing in production to some extent because you also want to make sure that you understand the experience your users have. And if there are things that are misbehaving or you know, infrastructure degradation or network degradation, that you can respond by scaling up applications or even troubleshooting infrastructure if need be. So your deployment process should be doing some great application testing. There should always be some tight monitoring in production so that you're detecting any sort of blips before your customers see them. A uh, follow-up question to your answer, Richard. Uh, does Pivotal Cloud Foundry have synthetic validation built in? I'd have to maybe get a definition of that, of what specifically that might look like. Could, would you uh, be able to define that a little better for me? Uh, I think it's coming from online, so what I would suggest is uh, let's take this offline and I'll put you in touch with the uh, person asking the question and we can, we can sort this out. Yeah, great. Uh, uh, there was another question online on what techniques in Redis make it so special and high performance. Uh, so the first thing is Redis is written in C and uh, does not have to deal with any additional latencies uh, like garbage collection in Java or whatever. So it is ex it's optimized for uh, extremely high performance. Uh, it is single threaded and lock free which contributes to its uh, high performance. And then the third thing is in addition, we, it includes uh, numerous optimization techniques that put performance at the front and center of all of its implementation, whether it's transactions, whether it's data structures, whether it's uh, uh, probabilistic estimates or analytics modules. Performance is sort of front and center for Redis, uh, and uh, this is what makes it very high performance. Even the data structures, when you uh, uh, implement the commands, they are optimized so that most of the commands are at order one complexity and uh, given that they're executed so fast in such an efficient manner, they even add a boost to data processing themselves. <clears throat> so I think uh, we are uh, we are now at the uh, at the conclusion of um, can you make me presenter so we can show these slides again. Uh, we are now at the conclusion of our uh, presentation. Uh, if you have any additional questions, uh, you can email expert at redislabs.com or you can even contact us on Twitter. You can see our Twitter handles both for Richard and myself on the, on the webinar. 
It has been a pleasure to have all of you join us for today's webinar. Uh, thank you so much for all the questions. And uh, we will send you a follow-up email with both the recording as well as a link to the slides. Thank you once again.